Naya Bugia Yalanga, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the University of Newcastle's Looking Ahead lecture series. Today, we're talking about an Indigenous voice to Parliament. How you all feeling? You feeling good? Yeah? Got me feeling like my mother. How are you going to get another voice if you don't use your first one? How are we feeling? Good? Yeah, that's it. That's better. Uh, hello, my name is Shani Wellington. Got a few people shaking. They're like, is she one of those audience engagement types? <laughs> and you should be scared because I absolutely am. Um, I'm a proud Geringer and Wandi Wandian woman and I'm absolutely privileged to be here being your MC tonight. I would firstly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians whose land we're meeting here today, the Awabakal and the Waramai peoples. And I would also like to acknowledge you and your stories. Um, and the ancestors of any of the mob that are present here and extend that to all of those people that are streaming in online. I hope you take the time to think about whose country you're on and wherever you are too. We're here tonight to talk about a voice, what it is, what it should look like, what it shouldn't look like, what it all means and the role that the university has in that process too. Now, usually around this point, we stop talking about country and we, we move on from our acknowledgement in, in events like that and you don't really hear about um, that connection, that unbroken connection to country and to Mother Earth. But I will ask you to do something for me tonight. Throughout tonight, as well as when you leave here, when you go home to your families, eventually when you walk into a voting booth for a referendum and when you carry on your journey, I want you to think about those people, those traditional custodians, those mob, those stories you hear tonight, the faces, and keep all of those mob front of mind. I want you to think about those on the ground, those who continue to pass on story and pass on language, and those that keep culture strong, and those that have marched and rallied and fought for our rights long before there was ever a yes or a no campaign whose survival and continued existence is resistance in itself. Now, in my previous roles, I've had the very uh, wonderful honour of telling First Nations stories. And in my, you know, previous life, I was a political correspondent. And I stood in those big white halls where decisions were made and reports were handed down. And I've seen, the first, I've seen firsthand that disconnect, disconnect that there can be between policy, the political, and the people that it affects. And year after year, those reports were handed down, and we were told that we fell further behind. And that we were told that we are statistics defined by other people's standards of success. So while a referendum, it may be a question of yes or no, it will be real people who shoulder the weight of the outcome, who will or won't see real change as a result. So tonight, you will hear from five staunch, deadly, well-respected blackfellas, and they're going to give their thoughts and their perspective, perspective um, which I think is a huge honour for all of us here and it is courageous for them to get up there and share their own perspectives. So I'd like to give a big round of applause for our panel members for speaking up tonight. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that a lot of people will get insight tonight and learn from lived experience that we talk about, but it is really important that we do the work and that you go home from here today, you do your own research, you educate yourself, you talk to blackfellas in your own circles. Because as 2% around of the population, we won't be the deciding factor, but we will bear the weight of the outcome. So thank you for being here to all those who are speaking up and to all of those that are here listening to what we have to say. I'd like to firstly bring up onto the stage the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Newcastle and also its Reconciliation Champion, Professor Alex Zielinski Ayo.
Thank you, Shani, and uh, what a great tribute you are to our university and the work you do as a communications expert. Uh, those of you, Shani didn't mention, she was a, a great, uh, I guess, journalist and, uh, and a media presenter for the ABC and, uh, and NITV, and uh, certainly really a great representative for the Indigenous community. But uh, thank you for your warm welcome tonight and, uh, and the acknowledgement of country. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today, uh, the Wabakal and Waramai people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Well, good evening, everybody. I think we're really in store for a great evening. And uh, I'd like to actually acknowledge some guests here, and I'm really pleased to see uh, the Honourable Sharon Clayton, Federal Member for Newcastle, and a real champion for The Voice, and she's been doing great work in Canberra, and only a, few, a little while ago she was hosting a forum here in the, and, uh, with the Attorney General. And uh, I think it's uh, great to have you here, Sharon. You're always welcome at the University, and thank you for your support. And I welcome everyone here tonight. Uh, for, as I said, what promises to be a very insightful evening and, and we're focused on, I think, a very significant moment in our national history. At our university, we always take pride in the ways we connect with our communities. We always want to provide opportunities for the public to hear about big ideas and engage in meaningful discussion that advances the argument, takes us forward. Uh, and this may be around issues that we, we'd like to think about this locally, across our regions and around the world. This, tonight, is about a national issue. And uh, we very much think that our looking ahead events are very much about that. We're here to share the amazing work of our teams at, at the university. You'll hear from them tonight. And they're, but they're also inviting our communities and industry to join us in this conversation. And in doing so, we build knowledge and understanding which contributes to our nation. So our, our university is very proud of our commitment to the First Nations people. It is a priority, it's stated in our strategic plan, looking ahead, and, and there we span at all our activities, be it research, teaching, education, engagement, and how can we advance the Indigenous cause. And, and that ranges from putting on events like tonight, but also, I've got to say, it helps um, create opportunities for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students that, that they get to attend our university. And, and really, in the last few years, we're really making great strides. And, and I'm very pleased to announce that this year we've got over 1,700 Indigenous students enrolled uh, in, in the university. It's full-time equivalent, so it's actually more than that. And that's our largest number ever. It's nearly over 300 up on last year. And uh, it's just tremendous, and I, w I really want to acknowledge the university and our leadership teams, uh, and Nathan Towney and our, Wab our Wallatooka Institute, uh, led by Kath Butler. What a great job you're doing there. We're doing well with retention, but also attracting the students. And by the way, that co cohort of over 1,700 full-time students or equivalent is actually the largest in the, na in the country. So we should be very proud of that. And likewise, I'm very pleased to say that we've, when we collectively look at all the Indigenous staff that are employed in the university, we're now just over 3%, and that represents about 150 people. Uh, some of them working part-time and casual, but over nearly 100 full-time, and others working in various forms with the university. But that number in itself is also the largest in Australia. So well done in the, to our, our staff. So I just want to say that, uh, and. What are they doing? It's not just about educating our students, but also making sure that Indigenous knowledge is being implemented and embedded in our programs and how we work. So it's actually becoming a part of the way the university functions. And, uh, and, and part of that, we've been, we recognise that our university can show leadership in supporting rec reconciliation. And I'm very proud that we're living out our commitment every day. So that brings us to tonight's event. As you're aware, um, last, uh, later this year, the Australian public will decide whether First Nations people will have a voice that is recognised in our constitution. This will be the first referendum in more than 20 years, and for many of our students, the first in a lifetime for them. Some of them may have not even voted at all. 
you've just turned over, you've just got in over the age of 18. It's hard to believe uh, for folks like me, you haven't voted and, uh, and not even not been around when that last referendum we had in this country. So really we have a, a, a real obligation to help our students understand the significance of referendums and the power of a vote. So our university has a central role, we believe, about educating for a referendum what it means for society and especially for our First Nations determination. This is why the University of Newcastle has commenced an extensive and genuine consultation process. And this has been led by Professor uh, Nathan Tanney, our Pro Vice Chancellor for Indigenous Strategy and Leadership, in partnership with the Wallatuka Institute. Through this process, it's important we first listen to those who represent and, and are guided by their perspectives. They're, they and that they inform us about relevant information that needs to be absorbed and taken into account. This is um, why I'm pleased to be here tonight uh, with our panel of eminent and emerging Indigenous leaders. I have the pleasure and honour of actually introducing our speaker for tonight, who is going to set the scene, uh, Emeritus Professor John Maynard. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting John very soon after I joined the university, just over four years ago, and uh, he really touched me right from the get-go with his passion and commitment to the Indigenous cause, but also to our university and making sure the university is seen and regarded as a leader. So, Professor Maynard is a Waramai man with a trailblazing Indigenous historian, both in Australia and globally. His internationally recognised research has focused on the intersections of Aboriginal history and social history. And uh, made significant, he's made significant contributions to research fields of Aboriginal history, race relations and sports history. As one of Australia's first Indigenous professors, his work has been, had a profound and lasting impact on generations of students and researchers. His main publications have received critical, critical acclaim, including the Aboriginal Soccer Tribe, which was highly re recommended for the prestigious Walkley Award, Walkley Award, and the Aboriginal Stars on the Turf, on indi Indigenous identities and racing, which is inspired by his own family history, his dad, in fact, and, uh, and has earned him the Dimex Reader Choice Award. Professor Maynard has contributed his expertise as a prominent representative on boards and committees for government bodies. These include Deputy Chairperson of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Study, member of the Indigenous Higher Education Advisory Council, and he was Deputy Chair Humanities on the Australian Research Council College of Experts. He's been recognised for his important work among his many honours, which include in 1996, the recipient of the Aboriginal History Stanner Fellowship. He was named New South Wales Premier's Indigenous History Fellow in 2013, and he received our own university's Researcher of the Year Award in 2008 and 2012. Professor Maynard is a distinguished alumnus of our university. He was previously the director of our outstanding Wallatooka Institute, and certainly set it up for its success today. And he facilitated the Puri Global Indigenous Diaspora Research Centre, Diaspora, I should say, Diaspora Research Centre. He's a firm believer in education to achieve equality, something that our university espouses. It's one of our core values, and John absolutely walks and talks that. He's very much committed to sharing his research and writing with Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to enjoy and to learn from him. We're very lucky to have him as our keynote speaker tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Emeritus Professor John Maynard. Ah, thanks very much, Alex, for that, um, that kind introduction and welcome everybody. Oops. Um, I too, as a Warramai man, uh, would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners, both the Awabakal and my own mob of Warramai peoples of this region, and pay respects to elders both past and present. Um, I'm honoured to speak on this important topic, looking ahead in Indigenous voice to Parliament 
As a historian, I emphasise it is critically important that before we look ahead, that we look back to the past at what has been overlooked. The most startling point of the referendum for a voice to parliament is the fact the majority of people in this country have no idea of history, and I mean both black and white. Australian history is written for nearly two thirds of the 20th century, glorified discoverers, explorers, settlers, and Gallipoli. We as Aboriginal people had been conveniently erased from the historical landscape and memory. Most Australians gave Aboriginal people little or no consideration. The majority of Aboriginal people were trapped in a historical vacuum through the fact that great numbers of our people had been confined to heavily congested and controlled missions and reserves. As part of this confinement, we were encouraged to forget our past. Everyday decisions were removed from people. They were told what to eat, what to wear, who you could marry, and movement was severely restricted. There was a process of historical erasure and memory. We were to be severed from any sense of past or inspiration. We could not participate in ceremonies, speak our language, tell our stories, practice songs and dances, or conduct our everyday hunting and living experiences. Over time, our people could only remember the controlled life on the reserve. It became the pattern of misery. In his 1968 Boyer lecture, After the Dreaming, anthropologist W.E.H. Stanner exposed Australia's failure to regard, record, or acknowledge Aboriginal people in the country's history. Australian history, he said, had been constructed with a view from a window which had been carefully placed to exclude a whole quadrant of the landscape. What is critically important in history understanding is that the call for a voice to parliament is not a new initiative. Aboriginal activists nearly 100 years ago first called for a voice to parliament as part of their political platform and demands during the 1920s. The first all Aboriginal political organisation, the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, the AAPA, was formed in Sydney in 1924 and led by my grandfather, Fred Maynard. And he's pictured here with his sister, Emma, at the Rocks in Sydney in 1927 at the height of his political activity. And that's the logo of the organisation, the AAPA. Now, the AAPA advocated several key demands in protecting and fighting for the rights of Aboriginal people that centred on a national land rights agenda. They demanded enough land for each and every Aboriginal family in the country. This is the 1920s. They protect, wanted to protect Aboriginal children from being torn from their families and placed in institutions by the Aborigines Protection Board. They called for a genuine Aboriginal self-determination. They wanted citizenship in our own country and defending a distinct Aboriginal cultural identity. And importantly, they, had the, they demanded the insistence that Aboriginal people be placed in charge of Aboriginal affairs. The call for Aboriginal rights to land was explicit. My grandfather declared in the press in the 1920s, the request made by this association for sufficient land for each eligible family is justly based. The Aboriginal people are the original owners of the land and have a prior right over all other people in this respect. The AAPA's first conference was front page news in the Sydney press, noting the old and young were there, the well-dressed matronly woman and the shingle girl of 19, the old man of 60 and the young man of athletic build all are fighting for the preservation of the rights of Aborigines for self-determination. The banner headlines, and as I said, front page press in Sydney, the banner headlines read, on Aborigines aspirations, first Australians to help themselves, self-determination. And Aborigines in conference, self-determination is their aim to help a people. This call for Aboriginal self-determination in 1925 
is remarkably 50 years before the Whitlam Labor government who are credited in putting up self-determination as an Aboriginal policy. Now, over 200 Aboriginal people attended this conference at St David's Church and Hall in Riley Street, Surrey Hills, and the opening section of my grandfather's inaugural address was also, as president of the AAPA was also covered in the press. And he said, Brothers and sisters, we, are here, we have much business to transact, so let's get right down to it. We aim at the spiritual, the political, the industrial and the social. We want to work out our own destiny. Our people have not had the courage to stand together in the past, but now we are united and are determined to work for the preservation of all of those interests which are near and dear to us. In the space of six short months, the AAPA had expanded to 14 branches, four sub-branches, and a membership in excess of 600. They established their own offices in Crown Street, Sydney, and set up a statewide network of information regarding what was happening to Aboriginal people on missions and reserves across the state. Aboriginal people were very good at getting news um, to the AAPA. Late in October 1925, the association held a second conference in Kempsey, New South Wales, and it ran for three days. The Maclay Argus and the Maclay Chronicle newspaper said that over 700 Aboriginal people attended this three-day conference. All the papers were written and delivered by Aboriginal speakers. Some of those papers, the newspapers recorded, were delivered in Aboriginal lingo and Aboriginal language. And this is a time the anthropologists are already making an impact in saying, culture in New South Wales is gone. Our mob it wasn't gone, we were still speaking it. We were carrying those stories. It was noted in press coverage of the conference that pleas were entered for direct representation in Parliament. And at the conclusion of the conference, my grandfather delivered the pow following powerful resolution that was delivered to both the Commonwealth and state governments. And I'll just quickly go on to the, that was the front page news in the Sydney press. And see that, a demand a voice. It's just there as part of that coverage. And his resolution, he said, as it is the proud boast of Australia that every person born beneath the Southern Cross is born free, irrespective of origin, race, colour, creed, religion or any other impediment, we the representatives of the original people in conference assembled demand that we shall be accorded the same full rights and privileges of citizenship as are enjoyed by all other sections of the community. Two years later, in 1927, the AAPA produced a manifesto. It was delivered to all sections of government, both state and federal, and published widely across New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria and Queensland. One of the significant points of this manifesto was for an Aboriginal board to be established under the Commonwealth Government and for state control over Aboriginal lives to be abolished. It envisioned the control of Aboriginal affairs apart from common law rights shall be vested in a board of management comprised of capable educated Aboriginals under a chairman to be appointed by the government. And I have to say this board would not be comprised of government selected or hand-picked individuals but would be elected Aboriginal officers. This push for an all Aboriginal board or place in Parliament continued in 1929 when my grandfather was invited to speak to the Chatswood Willoughby Labor League in New South Wales on Aboriginal issues. And they said he was fighting by both voice and pen to make change in Aboriginal affairs. And a report in the Labor Daily newspaper that year mentioned his call as part of this particular meeting with the Labor League. And he said, and it said Aboriginal representation in the federal parliament were failing it, they were demanding, to have an Aboriginal ambassador appointed to live in Canberra to watch over his people's interests and advise the federal authorities. The AAPA disappeared from public view in late 1929. And I mean, there is very, very strong evidence the organisation was effectively broken up through the combined efforts of the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board uh, the missionaries and the police. And you've got to remember at that time, New South Wales was a police state for us. 
Some people may argue in some cases it still is. But the reality is at that particular point in time, the protection board, the chairman of the New South Wales Aborigines Protection Board was the police commissioner of New South Wales. The state government and the protection board had been embarrassed by the exposure of their unjust policies in the media and they wanted the organisation broken up and uh, they certainly unleashed their hounds upon that uh, course. My grandfather in a newspaper interview in late 1927 revealed the level of surveillance, threat, intimidation and abuse he and the other Aboriginal activists were subjected to. He said that he'd been warned on many occasions that the doors of Long Bay Jail were opening for him. He would chiefly go to jail for the remainder of his life, he declared, if by so doing he could make the people of Australia realise the truly frightful administration of the Aborigines Act. He knew cases where children had been torn from their mothers and sent into absolute slavery. When one ponders upon the legacy of the AAPA, the sad reality is that if the demands of these early activists had been met nearly a hundred years ago, we would not be suffering the severe disadvantage that hovers over Aboriginal lives still today. Imagine if enough land for each and every, every Aboriginal family to build their own economic independence had been granted during the 1920s, or that we would not have suffered another five or six decades of Aboriginal child removal and the shocking impact of that policy on generations of Aboriginal lives. If the demand to protect a distinct Aboriginal cultural identity had been taken up, we would not be today working to piece together the shattered cultural pieces of language, stories, songs and dances. And finally, if Aboriginal people had been placed in a position to oversee Aboriginal policy and needs, the history of our people would have been vastly different. The reality today is we continue to fight for the demands that the AAPA established nearly 100 years ago. In closing, to all of our people here tonight and all of those people that support us, stay strong. The fight for Aboriginal justice in this country goes on. Thank you. I reckon you should stick around. stick around. He's got the shortest distance to walk, to walk there. Um, thank you, Professor Maynard. It's so important that truth-telling is a big part of this process, and I think that's a pretty deadly foundation to lay before we get stuck into a panel. So a big round of applause. Now, forgive me, but I don't think I can read out that bio of yours again. No, Far no. out. <laughs> I don't think we got the time. No. Um, Professor, if you could just take a seat with us. We will get started on our panel. Um, we do have four other deadly panellists joining us tonight. So, first off, I would like to please welcome, and big rounds of applause, please, because most of these people are my bosses. The more applause, <laughs> the longer I keep my job. So, do it for me. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Nathan Towney. He's a proud Wiradjuri man and Pro Vice Chancellor of Indigenous Strategy and Leadership at the University of Newcastle. <laughs> Next up, we have Associate Professor Kath Butler. She's a Bundjalung and Waramai woman and Head of Institute at the Wallatook Institute. Thank you, Kath. Joining us is Dr. Ray Kelly. He is the deputy head of the Wallatooka Institute. He's a Dangari and Gumbangi speaker who has dedicated his research to the revitalization of our language. Welcome, Dr. Ray. And last but not least, we have our sister, Kashaya Delaney. She is a proud Wiradjuri woman who graduated from Newcastle Law School just recently in 2020. She's currently a solicitor and was also part of the Uluru Statement Youth Dialogue. Welcome to our wonderful panel.
How are we going? Good. You still with us? Yeah. Good, because we're just getting started now. <laughs> um, look, I am. When we're talking here, the energy is quite high, but there is a bit of an emotional load that comes with this conversation. So I did want to start off with a bit of a big one. How is everyone feeling? And I wanted to start with you, Uncle Ray, to check in and just get a quick whip around because I know that we could probably all talk for a while about that. Um, yeah, just very quickly, I'm feeling great. Um, um, got to the doctor's last night and he says, you've got, no, you've got asthma, here you go, take a couple of these. Um, what were they steroids? Man, I'm ready to go. <laughs> He wouldn't miss it, people. He wouldn't miss yeah. it. Um, look, just quietly, uh, quietly, quickly. It sounds, it sounds like somebody used to say that years ago. <laughs> um, John's opening remarks brought back a number of things for me to um, just to put me into perspective of where t tonight is. Uh, during the 1930s, my uh, grandmother on my father's side was indentured to the, through the Aboriginal Protection Board. Um, during the 1930s, my grandparents were um, um, picked up and removed to um, Burnt Bridge as a part of that uh, new reform just after the dis demise of the, um, your grandfather's uh, leadership. So I know too full, uh, only too full well about that. Um, my mother was um, removed uh, by the still the, still the protection board. Um, uh, out of Armadale at the age of about 12 or 13. So it doesn't take much to, to scratch the surface for me. Um, but m I can put that into perspective because I've got grandkids and I want my grandkids to have a future. I want them to be the individual individuals that they want to be mm -hmm. and I want them to make a contribution to a, to a, country, uh, to a country that respects them. I think a lot about what we're here talking about here tonight is the future and Nath, I saw your young fella Archie here, he's there supporting you. <laughs> yeah, waving up the back there. How are you feeling? Do you have him in front of mind too? Very much so. Yeah, I, I'm feeling optimistic. Uh, I think that we're in, a, we're in a very different place, luckily. Um, there is a groundswell of people that, that, are, that know the truth now. Um, that, that understand the impact that those historical um, injustices have played in the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. And, you know, again, though, we, we are relying on non-Aboriginal people to, to stand up and influence the, the lives of our young people, of our children, of our grandchildren. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the it's something that I think is a, the, the way that our country has evolved still has that sentiment of non-Aboriginal people getting to dictate and decide the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and you know you look at you look at some of those people that are coming out making noise and I'll, I'll call it noise because I think that's all it is to really try and to distract from the the conversations that need to happen and you know they are they the people that should really get to dictate and decide what happens for me and my family? Well, I would think not. Um, I, would, I would want, as a proud Wiradjuri man, I would want um, our communities to, to be able to have a structure where they can input and, and have a say into, into what they feel success should look like. And I know you mentioned that in your opening remarks. Um, we, while ever testing. While ever we're trying to measure up to parameters that are not set by us, it always makes it really difficult. So, you know, I'm feeling really optimistic. I feel like they're, we're, we are in a good position and I feel like that, uh, you know, if still a still wor little worried about some of the structures and processes and, you know, how all this will happen, but it's not about what it looks like next year or the year after. It's about, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ahead, ahead that, you know, that structure will evolve and change. The people um, will evolve and change, but if it's embedded in that constitution, they can't get rid of it. And that's the, that's the thing that's important for me. I think coming off John's 
opening remarks, um, I think a bit of healthy scepticism is um, pretty much in line here. What about you, Kath? How are you feeling? Well, I mean, I've had the incredible privilege of hearing John speak many times and I think that one of the things that it always brings home for me is that, you know, we listen to the histories of our old people and we take up you know, many of the same themes that they're talking about. So whether the voice gets up this time or whether it's our children or our grandchildren, I have every confidence that as a people, we will continue. Mm. And I think, you know, that story really comes out strongly mm. from your grandfather's work, from what Ray um, was talking about. We see ourselves as inheriting a tradition of storytelling, mm. but we also see ourselves as inheriting responsibilities to see that justice is done. Mm. I think that at the heart of our culture, there's a very clear concept of fairness and justice, and whether it is this generation, you know, we hear it said this is a once in a generation opportunity. So I think that we need to very clearly say, you know, should the no vote get up, this is not the last time. Mm. There are generations to come and we already see in people like, like young Archie, you know, I know in, in my kids, in, in Ray's kids, mm. I see, um, you know, young people like Keshaya, we know that those next generations are already on their way, so. Mm. One, one sad reflection on what I've just spoke about is, though, a hundred years on, we are still fighting for the very same things. Mm. And I agree with what Cathy says, but I wouldn't like to be seeing the future in a hundred years where we're still standing up, making the same demands. Mm. The country's got to shift, you know, and they've got to recognise that. So that is the really important point of all of this. Mm. I just want to add one thing to that, and sorry, I'll, I'll, well, no, we want to get to Kashaya. Um, we sat in this room, Sharon Clayton had an event, and the Attorney General was here, and my colleague Lauren Collier in the front row, in her closing remarks on that night, said something that really resonated with me, and she said that Aboriginal people have always had a voice, and this is more about people having ears, yeah. and, and, and actually listening. And you know. Round of applause for Lauren. Yeah. For Lauren. <laughs> We'll get her up later. She can she can get her own applause as well. Um, and Kashaya, how are you feeling? Um, I think I'm definitely feeling that sense of um, positive energy and excitement and motivation. I think um, I've only had a very short career so far, but I've been involved in the Uluru Statement work since 2019. And back when I first started, it was much much harder to get people to listen. And so just having being at this event and having everybody here in the room and being able to sit here and have these conversations with such remarkable, well-respected people, it's I can't help but feel that sense of excitement. Um, but I I do think that, like you said, this is a really difficult time for um, a lot of First Nations people. It is, you, you, I, you do see a lot of racism. It is a hard debate and it's, I think, um, going to be a really big year. So there is that sense of fatigue of having to have so many conversations um, that really go to the heart of your sort of identity all the time. But overall, very um, positive, I think, and excited. And Kashay, while we've got you, you know, we, speak, we spoke briefly about the youth dialogue. Could you, is that too much to ask? Talk to us a little bit about what the voice and what those discussions were that you had with, with the young people and what they were saying. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the Uluru Youth Dialogue is a collective of First Nations young people from across the country who are really passionate about the Uluru Statement and the voice to parliament. And we're really lucky because we are supported by the guidance of our senior leadership and the delegates that attended the regional dialogues um, that led to the Uluru Statement from the heart. 
And so while it's um, like what John was saying, this is not the only petition to the government for these sorts of parliamentary representation, and it's only the most recent petition in a very, very long history. The Uluru Statement from the Heart was really what brought the voice to the forefront in recent memory. And what it showed was that when you have proper, meaningful conversations with First Nations people about what it means for them to be meaningfully recognised in the Constitution, what people wanted was a voice and something that would be have substantive change on the ground. Um, and so what they uh, sort of thought that the voice would be is a mechanism so that local communities would be able to have their opinions on matters of law and policy um, sort of filtered through state and regional voices through to a national voice and into the national legislative agenda because people were sick and tired of having laws made about them that impact their communities and then having to campaign like, you know, the Raise the Age campaign at the moment or sue the government because of um, environmental cultural heritage laws. Um, they were sick of having to do it afterwards and put all of that time and energy and resources that many communities don't have when there's another way to go about it and that's having a seat at the table at the start. And so, so many people thought of this as a real way to see real substantive change, but also to recognise First Nations people in their rightful place as the first people of this country. Thank you for that amazing description. John, I wanted to ask, talking about taking up the same fight that we've just seen that your father had, how do we, as mob, but also as voters, and I, you know, I think this one can be for the entire panel as well, how do we overcome the legacy of disappointment? With great difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> Easy as that. <laughs> Look, I, I think the best thing for me, I will be brutally honest, I am pessimistic when looking at the history of Australian Prime Ministers and Australian governments. I mean, I remain wary. You look back at the 1967 referendum, that was going to be the big moment for us. Great change. There was incredible uplift and excitement. Nothing came out the other end of it. That was followed by a genuine push for self-determination. It didn't materialise. Straight after that, we were promised a treaty and also um, a national land rights agenda. It nosedived. Followed up by... Um, Black Deaths in Custody report. Nothing about the implementation of that report and over 430 Aboriginal people have died in jail since that moment. The um, Bringing Them Home report, again, has sat there. So, yes, I'm pessimistic and I remain wary and I think a lot of Aboriginal people are. In saying that, I'll be open and honest, I will be voting yes. There's no question about that for me. My conscience and the memory of what my grandfather stood for wouldn't allow me to vote any other way. But the reality is I remain extremely wary and on guard. And um, we need to... And again, what, what was just said then in regards to outcomes of this, that our people do get a voice that goes through where actual genuine change can happen on the ground. Because we've seen so much money wasted and so many decisions we know what's best for you that have been complete failures. So again, I said, I remain wary. I want this to happen and I want it to happen in a positive way. But I will make a lot of noise if I'm pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have thoughts on that? Go. Go. Um, Look, I had the, you know, I was lucky enough last night to go to dinner with um, Alex, our Vice Chancellor, and, and Nathan uh, with the Greater Cities Commission, uh, which covers from the Illawarra to the Hunter. And one of the things that was really amazing for me was that in one table, there were four Aboriginal people. So there was Nathan, myself, and two leaders uh, who are CEOs of local Aboriginal lands councils. So when we talk about getting the seat at the table, I think John's right. There are some, some place-based local initiatives that are happening where we are getting that voice. Is it perfect? No. But, you know, we have to see this as a movement forward. And I think that that was, you know, something that 
really made me very hopeful that we could start to, um, to really shift some things you know, at this local level. Yeah, agree completely, Kath. And I think it's really important to reflect on this, not only for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. If we look at the state of the world at the moment, Indigenous thinking, Indigenous values systems, the way that we interact and treat Mother Earth, you know, those things are becoming so important for everybody. And so why wouldn't we want people to have a voice on, on things that are going to impact not only just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but provide those knowledge systems and value systems to, to broader issues that are going to benefit everybody. So those are the things that are really important to me. And as we sat around that table last night, Kath, that was the thing that was really, that stood out for me is that mm. people, the commissioners of the Greater Cities Commission didn't just want to have us at the table because it, was, it felt good and it was a nice thing to do, but they could see the value that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can add to planning, to design, mm. to create better communities. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we all want. Mm. <clears throat> um. In 1960, <clears throat> during the 1960s, an old man was recorded um, d delivering some language uh, in the Dangati space. He said, uh, He said, I went away to Kempsey on my horse. At Kempsey, he saw a lot of people of his own, color, of his own kind. I can only assume that this is, and the dates are, are perfect, that this is a personal recording of a man who attended the uh, Kempsey uh, conference. He did see a beautiful young woman there because he said, Ngai uh, nyal nyutu, pretty nyal nyutu. He did see a pretty face there. Um, but it's about... It's about how our stories have been recorded mm. uh, and about how it's being framed. One man's memory is as powerful as any documentation. Mm. And I think that that's the... If, if this referendum gets up, the one thing that I would want would be a, an open and fair election mm. where everybody gets to throw their hat in the ring where everybody gets measured by their own community support. Mm. But more importantly, we have to hold people to account. Mm. We have to have certain standards. This was clearly evident in, in our earlier cultural frameworks and it needs to be returned. We need to hold our own people accountable. And in doing that, uh, by, what I mean by that is that we have responsibility, even though our numbers are the we're the most we're the least um, uh, least amount of people who will have an influence in this referendum. We are the most important because it's about the future of our kids, children always, mm. always built on the legacy of the past. Mm. How many of our people lived, died in defence of, and under the under the great traumatic stresses of governments who failed to think about us and to care about us. So I'm still optimistic, John, because I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Um, but I know that, I know that um, political um, powers are, are, are like the wind. They come and they go. And I know that sometimes great leaders... Sorry. No, great leaders are great leaders. Politicians come and go. Mm. Um, and so I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm in it for the good fight. Um, and um, I don't know if I could say any more. <laughs> That's well put, Uncle. That's well put. Um, and I think you make such a good point about all people not getting lost, our old people you know, that might not have access to the resources that some of our young fellas do in this process. And having that 
accountability and also transparency. And I think that's a really big um, point to make in having these conversations, mm. open, safe dialogues where we can talk with each other and tell each other and inform each other about how we feel about this process. Mm. Uh, Kashaya, I wanted to talk to you. You know, we are talking a lot about our young ones and the future. What are, you, what are you, your thoughts and what are you hearing from young ones going to this? Do you see this as your fight? Yeah, I think that's why the Uluru youth, youth Dialogue has become such a strong group of people because we have heard stories like what we've heard tonight from our elders in our community about how this fight has been going for such a long time. And I think we feel particularly like that we have a really good opportunity here because it's the first referendum in a long time. It's the first referendum in the social media age. Um, people get news and they learn about things in such a different way to what they did 20 years ago. And so I think while in often in a lot of elections, young people, when they first turn 18, they vote the way their parents do. But I do think there will be a lot of people that will vote in this referendum based on what their kids are telling them about. Because kids, um, share a lot of information on, on TikTok and on social media, which you don't tend to see in um, mainstream media. And they're super engaged. I think we've got really, really high levels of support amongst young people because I think for a lot of young people, it almost seems like they just can't believe that it doesn't exist already. I think that's one of the things I hear a lot is that kind of, oh, well, obviously First Nations people deserve a voice, like can't we just get it over with? And I think, you know, that importance of having it protected in the constitution, um, it, it's really important to emphasize that with young people because we weren't around at the abolition of ATSIC. We didn't, haven't seen past bodies like this um, really get set up and then disbanded. So for a lot of young people, I think they're very motivated by the campaign, that we're very motivated by our elders. Um, we have a lot of great guidance going through this, but I do think they're gonna play such a pivotal role in the lead up to the referendum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And John, I just wanted to pick up on the point Kashaya made about the abolition of ATSIC. We talk about that because we know about it, but just quickly, what is the history there and that difference that a constitutionally enshrined body well, there's no, there's no way they can just remove it, as John Howard did at the time. And I mean, there was, that was such a tragic moment. I mean, all Aboriginal people with ATSIC at that time were branded as guilty of being doing the wrong thing. The reality is I was working in Aboriginal Island Health back in those days and working in lots of communities across the country where it was doing fantastic work on the ground. But with this, there is a protection, there is a protection valve, if you like, that it can't just be removed immediately by a prime minister or a, or a government. So that's the important thing in regards to this. And, and I think just on that as well, the, the difference with um, a body that's protected by the constitution is that so often bodies are set up by the government and most everyday Australians don't actually know that those bodies or those institutions exist. Mm. Whereas going through this process where every Australian of voting age has to turn their mind to the question of whether First Nations people need a voice means that the Australian public is gonna have a much greater sense of ownership of this body mm. if when it gets up because they will have, it'll be in the public interest for the parliamentarians to listen to it because that's what the majority of Australians want is they want a voice and they didn't go through this process to have a voice that is useless. So I do think that that makes a big difference between um, the, power, the sort of stability of the voice and that's it. I think there's another added uh, opportunity or benefit here and that is um, <clears throat> it, uh, the suggested model provides a level of safety around Indigenous people and Indigenous funds being seen as a political football. Um, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's as good as ATSIC, but I, I am, I'm a bit biased because I was a part of the, a part of the ATSIC structure. I was a former councillor and for the region and I believe that in, in due time we would have got to clear out some of the garbage and the rubbish had we been given the time. <coughs> But again, we became a political football. Um, and so if it's enshrined in the constitution, then political football all you like, let's kick, it up, let's kick the ball up and down the, the goalpost, but we'll be there tomorrow. 
will be there in the, in the next round of conversations. We'll be tormenting uh, the politicians, who, particularly the ministers around those things that are affecting our people on the ground that we know can bring change. If you actually enlist us, if you get us the support, if you give us the opportunity to help bring about change, we can do it. Um, I've got to go back to Kevin Gilbert, because a white man will never do it. We have to take the responsibility. We have to take the responsibility. Not to, not to do all the work, but to be a part of that mind shift, that cultural change. We've got to be, we've got to be firmly there in that space to do that, to help bring it about. And on that empowerment and those community solutions where they are, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. I don't know if everyone knows, but it's actually this year marks 40 years of the Wallatook Institute. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> now to Kath and Ray, 40 years of Wallatooka being a, what is a safe haven for our students at the university. What do you see as the message coming from students at the moment? Well, I think there's a, I think there's a healthy um, outlook for most of the students who come through Wallatooka. They know their place, and they know that they, that we ask, we ask a fair bit of them. We don't want them to only do well at their studies. We want them to have an open mind about the issues that affect our communities. Mm. We want them to to speak up when they need to speak up, not merely provide to their lectures the, the type of quantifiable um, essays that we want them to say things that are, that are, that are, are fair and just. But I note that, there, that Mandy Kelly and Cheryl Newton are sitting in, in, uh, in the room and I, I, feel, I feel a little bit underdone about trying to talk about 40 years of, um, of Wallatooka and John Maynard, you were there at that period of time as well. I know you've got a lot of good stories. <laughs> but I think, it's, I think it's very important to realise that 40, 40 years is sometimes a lifetime. Um, but I think it's, you know, I think it's... I think it's a good time for us to really have a refresh about where we're at. Um, but I, you know, I, I give to my boss here and I'll say, Kath, where are we going? Mandy's your boss, right? <laughs> yeah, but I kind of say, where are we going? <laughs> and, um, and I'll also jump in and say that sometimes there'll be a question, what happened in uh, Wallatooka, you know, sometime in, in the 90s? And I'll say, you know who will know? Mandy Kelly. So uh, I'll say, go ask Ray and get him to ask the boss um, who it is. Look, I agree with everything that Ray said, but... I also want to take up a point around this particular debate. You may have seen in the news where there are people talking against um, the Uluru Statement or against the Yes Voice because it's coming from urban, university-educated Aboriginal people, as if that is uh, a negative connotation. The thing about 40 years of Wallatooka and again, this, this idea of history, is that Aboriginal people who go to university don't just do it for themselves. They do it as a responsibility for their community to become upskilled, to transform the university. You know, we need to really stop sending a mixed message to our young people because on the one hand we're saying you should have an aspiration to go to university if that's what you choose but then at the other on the other side we see even some of our black leadership present being university educated as if that is something which strips us from our culture but certainly uh, Ray and uh, John uh, Ken and, and Nathan can tell you uh, that our students are constantly asking for more culture, not less. 
they're constantly talking about how do we take this back to their community. They are talking about how do we strengthen our identities, not how do we lessen it. So, you know, I really think that um, we need to be very wary of seeing that gaining a university education is somehow comes at the expense of our Aboriginality. And I think that the other thing there, you know, about being urban Aboriginal people is this is country. Mm. People talk about, oh, we have to go out and get on country. This is country. You know, this is my country. This is, you know, for John and I. You know, um, my grandparents met on the headland. I know stories about this country. And it doesn't matter what is built on top of it. It is still our country. Well said, Kath. I just want to follow up with something that you just said, Kath, and it, it reminds me of a question that I was asked when I was a trainee teacher um, all those years ago, and it was while I was at Wallatuka, and it was by Uncle Bob Morgan, who was speaking to a, um, a group of Aboriginal trainee teachers, and the question that he asked was, are you going to be an Aboriginal teacher, or are you going to be a teacher who just happens to be Aboriginal? And it really made me reflect on what that meant and what I needed to bring to my role as a teacher and that my cultural identity was going to be my strength in that the values, the knowledge systems that had been instilled in me in my home community of Wellington, growing up with my dad, my mum, my aunties and uncles, you know, instilling those things into me to reflect on what that meant for me as a, as a teacher, then as a, a head teacher, a deputy principal, a principal, and now uh, someone working in the university, what does that actually mean and what can I bring to that so that I don't lose that cultural identity? And it was Wallatuka that, that instilled that in me and that's what we do. You know, I can see some of our um, students in the audience and you know, I know that they, they are thinking about those things all the time, whether it's in the law space, whether it's in the medicine space, um, whether it's you know, being an architect. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be an Aboriginal architect? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just an architect who happens to be Aboriginal. We bring so much more than that. And so I think that's an important um, reflection on Wallatooka and what you've just said. And I think there is a bit of fear-mongering going on in the discussion to say who speaks for who and who gets a voice in this discussion. And I think that's really important to, you know, think about what you are saying and know, be strong in your own voice and to know that you do have a right to get up there and speak up. Um, Nath, I want to come back to you because we are talking about the broader discussion and our personal perspectives, but I did want to ask about the university's role in all of this. You know, as a university, we don't stray away from, po stray away from political debate, but what do you see the role of the university in the coming months as we go into this referendum? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing to reflect on. You know, what is the role of a university in, in something like this that has public debate around it? And are we a place that just uh, provides opportunities like this to have, have conversation? Do we, do we actually take a position um, and come out for that position? And who gets to decide what that position is? You know, I don't want that weight on my shoulders that it's not my, not my decision. But I reflect on going to the UA conference earlier this year and Professor Megan Davis gave the keynote speech and she made it very clear and she put it on all of the vice chancellors, the deputy vice chancellors that were in that room and said, you know, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to be a place of just debate or are you going to show some courage and actually do some intensive consultation and come out and talk about what that consultation has resulted in. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're going to do. And we've, we've started consultation, we've developed a, a consultation plan. Uh, we've already started that. We've had some conversations with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students through the Wallatuka barbecues. We've had a two and a half hour conversation with our Aboriginal staff through our employee network, which was you know, overwhelmingly positive. You know, our staff want the university to be strong in a position. Mm -hmm. 
You know, they, they want our university to show that courage. And so um, that's what we're doing as a, as a team. We're, we're, we're engaging in those conversations. We're gathering people's um, perspectives. We're asking people what more information do they want to know so that we can plan um, future engagements and activities to help people understand and feel as though they can make the best informed decision that they can. Um, but we're hoping, um, with our Vice-Chancellor, that you know, once we've done that, that you know, around August, September, we'll be able to be able to come out as a university and and have a position on on what we what we feel. And Kashaya, when we talk about you know the institution and the role the university has, how do you see your personal role in this conversation? Is there any advice you can give to followers that are here in the audience or on the stream that are thinking, how do I engage? Yeah, I think um, while this is a topic which at the moment there's a lot of debate playing out in the media, I think this referendum will be won or lost based on the conversations that people have with their family and friends. And I think people are going to vote um, in the referendum based on the things that they read and the people that they talk to and the way their family votes. Um, but I really do think that Everybody, um, this is a, sig a very significant moment in Australia's history and this has a real potential to be a really uniting moment for the country. And I do think that there is an obligation um, for individuals to take that responsibility and educate yourselves. I think um, a lot of First Nations people are probably wearing the burden of having to explain this to people rather than people going out and just doing the research themselves. This isn't a new idea. This has been something that has been talked about for many, many years and there are a lot of really, really great resources. Um, just like the... the uh, um, Election Commission, I'm losing Australian Election, election AEC. AEC, yeah, they have really great information about the referendum process, so if you want to have a look at that, that is really useful. The Government's Voice website, um, which is hosted by the National Indigenous Australians Agency, has really great information about the design principles for the voice and the question and what the amendment actually means. So there is a lot of information out there that you don't need to get into the nitty-gritty legal technical detail to be well informed enough to be able to have a conversation about it. And you're not going to just have one conversation. It takes many conversations with people for people to feel like they have a good understanding. So I think given that you've come to this event, you're obviously interested in learning more about The Voice. So really don't take this as a one-stop shop and make sure you're keeping up to date and looking at really credible resources because like we've seen with the most recent elections, there is a lot of misinformation out there and um, it is important to be a bit more critical. I think one thing that I was having a conversation about today is, you know, when we get to the referendum, you're going to receive a yes, no pamphlet. And there is nothing to say that anybody has to fact check that pamphlet. It's written by politicians. So when you go to the referendum, remember that, that it doesn't actually have to be accurate. And think about that when you're reading media articles and things about the voice and about the debate, because there are a lot of people out there that will be happy to mislead you to to make you vote one way or another. So, yeah, it's really up to you to stay informed. Johnny, oh, go on. I just wanted to say thank you very much for your words. Uh, what Brilliant. Look, um, when anybody ever asks me which way I will vote, I often tell them to bugger off. <laughs> <laughs> because it's my vote, and I take my vote personal. I'm happy if you see me right. I'm happy to wear a flag or a colour or a, a thing to say that's what I'm doing. But it's my vote. And I will, I, if somebody asks me which way you vote, and I said, oh, you'll know when I've done it. Because I don't think that that's the right thing for people to do. Votes are very personal and they're very important. And if it's in your heart to, to, to vote one way, you should follow that but you shouldn't allow anybody to tell you otherwise because that's one of the things that we, we've been talking about here tonight, not just about misinformation, but, a, but about the refusal to listen, mm. the failure to hear, the, the lack of desire to, to, hear, to understand the, the, the issue. I think great change is coming. And it may not be in this referendum, but it's certainly coming with young people 
Well, Kaisha, isn't it? Kaisha. I, I think, I think our country He's is a not. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a linguist, yes, but I, I've had long COVID. I've had long COVID. Yeah, and I'm a storyteller too. But I think it's important to, to, to uh, I want to make one point, and it's about good leadership. And I made a comment earlier about politicians are just politicians, but some, some people are just absolutely the bee's knees. This community, as a young man I came here and I've seen the rem most remarkable things happen in this community. Lord Mayor Joy Cummings flew the flag over this, uh, this town hall for the first time anywhere in this country. I worked alongside Sharon Grierson, uh, for, um, Alan Morris, um, but also people who were not on the Labor ticket, uh, the Greens. I've seen some fantastic things come out of this, this community of Newcastle. And Alex, we are making a fist of things as well. We really, this is the town that gets action done, I believe, and I've often seen that. I, I, re, I reflect because there's a little bit of emotion around the longevity of the fight. But the truth is the fight goes on. And so thank you for being our champion for tomorrow. Hey. I was, I was just going to add one thing, and it, and it related to what Kashaya said around, you know, listening to the debate and hearing mixed messages and hearing different people's opinions. And it made me reflect on something that Professor Megan Davis said at the UA conference. And she said, when all that happens, think, of, go back to the, pr the principle of what we're actually voting on. Should Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a say on the laws and the policies that impact them. As soon as people want to start to talk about the detail and say that that hasn't been decided, well, that'll evolve and change. Mm. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll make, hopefully make that more effective and we'll continue to work on it. But at the end of the day, that's the principle-based decision that we're voting on. Mm. And we shouldn't lose sight of that. And if, if people start to debate too much and want to, want to sway from that, principle-based decision, bring people back to it. Mm. And that, that's, that, that was a really great piece of advice that I picked up from Professor Davis. Mm. Now, we do have a question and answer session to come up. Um, I did want to ask very quickly, because we are an institution of teachers, I want everyone to throw their mind forward when they teach about the 2023 referendum, what do you want them to say? What do you hope that they will say? And what will, the, what will be the reality of a yes or a no vote? Um, despite declaring my pessimism earlier, <laughs> I mean, I think realistically, and, and it should be taught in the future, that the country was suddenly on the threshold of such a wonderful opportunity. Where we, where we healed from the past. And people, all peoples of this country, joined hands and walked to a future that was just and equitable for all Australians. And the reality is that suddenly the country has awakened that its greatest treasure, Aboriginal people and culture, and 65,000 years of belonging to this continent was suddenly realised. And that happened in 2023. I think that was pretty well said. Do you got something, Nath? Yeah, I've got something. He's a teacher. Always, <laughs> always, always got something, you know that, Sean. I'd like to think that when they look back on it, there'll be things that we can't even imagine now that have been achieved, structures, things that have happened that they look back on and say, well, it was actually that decision in 2023 that facilitated and allowed the thinking to create these things. And I don't know what they are. You know, but it excites me to think about what they could be and the, and the significant shift and change that we will see in our communities because of the movement that we, we hopefully can create. 
I'd really like to have it remembered that we had conversations. That, um, you know, as Ray has said, which has very much been the Wallatooka position, make an informed decision. You know, we do have both students and staff uh, among our Aboriginal and, and Torres Strait Islander group who intend to vote no. And, you know, some people, I think, have said very clearly to me, so what is Wallatooka's position? Wallatooka's position is ask, be informed, and make your choice and exercise that as a responsibility. You know, don't just vote yes or no out of fear. Don't just vote yes or no out of I don't knows. Vote out of taking the time to develop a position. And, you know, um, I think that we need to have courageous conversations. You know, uh, I heard it said the other day that um, perhaps 30% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people intend to vote no. One of the things which we need to do is we do need to address what are their fears. Um, we've had discussion mm. earlier that Aboriginal people have historical disappointment, that governments have failed to make real and make practical the change that they said was coming. So if I hear someone say, I don't trust the government, I don't blame them for that. And I think that one of the things that really has come out of, you know, some of our quick media is this idea that if someone doesn't agree with us, that means that somehow we are in conflict and opposition. You know, I think that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people agree that we need to have our voices heard. If we differ on how that occurs, that doesn't mean that we are not united as a people. Mm. And so we really do need to come out of this, mm. whether the vote is yes or no, with a very clear, continued mandate that our voices must be heard. Mm. So. Thank you, Kath. <laughs> the Poet Laureate is an Indigenous woman. She's remarks about voices in the ears. She takes the word of a nation, the thoughts, the, the challenges within the community, the, the uncertainties, the frailties, and weaves a story for tomorrow. I think that there is every opportunity that a country can heal, mm. but it has to be truthful. The sad, long truth about our history is that there have been untold trauma, death, and, forget and forgetting. I think that we have to allow that poet, poet laureate to build visions and, 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 and a new song. A new song. We need a new song. We need a new anthem. An anthem that's blended with the history. That carries all of those... Um, all of those wants for, for all of our community. I think we need that. I'm looking forward to the, to the Poet Laureate's response to um, the passing of the, the referendum. Got to be quick, yeah? Yeah, I'll be quick because that was just really powerful to hear. And I just, I want to echo what you were saying, Uncle, because I feel like we're going to think back of 2023 as such a significant point in time of, of truth-telling as our country because never before, in, well, in my lifetime, but we haven't had a moment like this in so long where 
all of Australians are really turning their mind to the issue of um, First Nations people and, and the position of First Nations people in society. And the Uluru Statement from the Heart calls for truth-telling because many of the delegates that were there spoke about the fact that if our country doesn't understand where we've come from, how can we move forward? And truth-telling can mean many different things at many different levels, but this exercise throughout the year and the lead-up to the referendum is just such a significant moment of truth-telling and having so many people turn their minds to this question. So in my mind, I think we'll think of this as a real turning point and hopefully a real um, redefinition of the relationship between First Nations people and non-Indigenous people. We are on the precipice of history, my people. We will open it up now to the audience for questions. I've been told that's a microphone, weirdly enough. <laughs> Um, if you feel okay to share this, um, I would love to hear if the refer if imagining that the referendum has happened and the vote is yes, and if you don't mind sharing this for each of you, um, if your grandparents happen to be here now at that point in time, what might that mean for them, please? Mm. What was your name? Sorry, Mary. Mary. Yeah, well, you know, my, my point on, on history, I mean, that my grandfather and that organisation 100 years ago were making the demand then. So I think they would look upon this moment, you know, as a great moment for the country and predominantly a great moment for Aboriginal people in this country. So, yes, I think they would look upon it very favourably and very in you know, a positive light in regards to that, that finally, you know, the country may have woken up Uh, I didn't get to meet my grandparents, but I've been able to connect with them in ways through um, when we, I, I helped my dad and my aunties and uncles um, chase my pop stolen wages. And as part of that, we got a file. And in that file were some amazing documents that helped me form a connection with them that I will cherish forever. And in that were some handwritten letters from my nan uh, requesting my pop's wages be paid in cash as opposed to um, rations and vouchers. Um, and in the file was also the responses that were received back from the Aborigines Protection Board, um, basically using particular language that was um, just not right. Um, but I got a sense of, of the type of people that my nan and pop were through those letters and through this file that I received, how hard working they were, um, how they just wanted a fair go. Mm. And so, you know, f for me, um, I think about them a lot and I think about what life was like for them and what life was like for my dad with 12 siblings growing up on the mission, Nanama Mission, um, a common just outside of Nanama Mission, um, just outside of Wellington. And I think about how privileged I am um, and the, but then the obligation and responsibility that I have to them. And so that's what carries me and, you know, I hope that I'm fulfilling and making them proud. Yeah. I think my family story is a similar story for, for many urban Aboriginal people. So I have an Aboriginal set of grandparents and I have a non-Aboriginal set of uh, grandparents. My non-Aboriginal uh, set of grandparents actually went to a dance for the Foundation for Aboriginal Affairs, taking my father, which is where he met my mother. So, um, you know, they were people that were open to the idea of Aboriginal rights. Uh, I know my dad's twin brother remembers around the time of 1967 having someone say to him, Oh, but, you know, like, what if your brother married one of them? And my uncle looked back and said, I'm quite fond of my sister-in-law, actually. <laughs> uh, you know, so I think, um, you know, that they had not just this idea about rights, but also a real cheekiness around it as well. I think for my Aboriginal grandparents, you know, I tell the story about how my grandfather was a street sweeper for the city of Sydney after uh, the family moved to Waterloo 
and one of the places that he would sweep the streets was outside of New South Wales Parliament House. And when our daughter got to speak in Parliament House, my husband said to her, remember someone swept that road for you. Um, yes, I only um, have vague memories of my grandfather on my father's side who played a mighty fiddle. Um, I guess that's why I like Irish music. Um, um, but the most um, uh, vivid um, me well, memory I have of a grandparent um, supporting a, a child is my grandmother. Um, the loss of some children to protection board or the welfare board or the, being in indentured, um, living in squalor, fighting for rights in the East Armadale Aboriginal Reserve, um, making fires outside because the houses were too damn cold, whistling, whistling when I went over to show her my uh, white shirt with uh, with my comb over going to the first dance <laughs> giving that w cheeky wolf whistle but always always um, optimistic um, excited about anything that we were involved in all of the kids every one of her grandchildren she must have had 50 60 of us Every one of us felt that she had been cheering for us at any event that we went to. So today, I think she would be uh, she'd be cheering for, um, perhaps cheering us on. Get in there and have a go. Get in the fight. Um, but I would love to. Uh, I would love to dream of her whistling with and cooing up, you know, sometime next year. Uh, so I have one grandparent left, which is my nan, um, and I think when the referendum gets up, she'll be very happy because she's come to a few of the um, information sessions that I've done back home in Orange, and I was there the other week, and she came to the two sessions that I did, and I said to her after, I was like, Nan, what did you think? And she was like, oh, I don't know. I didn't have my hearing aids in, but I thought you were great. <laughs> Blind support, <laughs> just... Yeah. Yeah, so, but I, I do think, I reflect a lot about her mother, who um, was born on a mission and then was removed as a, as a young teenager, and, and I think of the way that her identity was shaped by the way that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were seen in the country at the time, and very much growing up in that environment that John was talking about, um, where it was that police state, and there was that fear of um, your identity and expression, and the ongoing impact that that has to a family and um, her children. And so I feel like, in my mind, I think this, this moment of kind of recognition and of belonging for First Nations people within the broader Australian society, I think that would have a really significant impact on, on her identity and her acceptance of her identity. I think this shows just how much it's, it's so much bigger than just us as individuals, isn't it? Thank you for your question, Mary. Do we have any others? Hands up. Don't be shy. We did pretty good. We covered all bases, did we? Oh, here we go. There we go. Latecomers down the front here. halfway through writing it, so hopefully I remember it. Um, so Anthony Albanese recently remarked on an incredible Indigenous man that passed, uh, Yanu Pingu, and he remarked on how he understood that to have an impact is to have a voice and to be involved, to actively get involved. So that's what you have to do to make a difference. Do you think that is a true statement and do you think that is reflective of what's going on at the moment? Yeah, 
Yeah, so Galloway um, Unipingu, who passed away yeah. recently, um, and he was such a significant figure in, in the fight for constitutional recognition, and he has been for decades. And um, I think, yeah, you definitely have to get involved. And I think we wouldn't be here at this point in history if it weren't for the people that have been involved and have maintained this fight for many, many years. Um, people that are sitting here tonight, but people that have been really fighting for the constitutional recognition and the voice and just improving the lives of First Nations people. Um, it's not something that people take lightly and I think it's a career that um, a, a lot of people feel a, a mandate for to do um, as part of giving back to their community. So I definitely think it's, yeah, you have to be involved to, to play that part. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's also important though to reflect on the historical experience as to why people may not be involved and you know, may think, well, what's the point of being involved when, you know, when, I, when the stories that I've heard when we do become involved actually you know, becomes detrimental to, to me and my family and, and we actually become targets. And so I think you know, hopefully a referendum getting up would mean that it would give our people the confidence to say, well, actually things have shifted. And it, it is time for us to actually start to stand up and be involved in a, in a more um, active way and give people at a, in a larger volume in communities that chance to actually stand up and, and have a say and, and not think that those historical experiences will actually then turn around to, to be a negative. Mm. And I think that, you know, another thing that we can really acknowledge is that as a result of a voice, people may call for a treaty. Mm -hmm. you know, a voice and treaty are not mutually exclusive. We can have both. And, uh, you know, so I think that, you know, there are so many potentialities that, um, that we can have. Yeah, and the truth-telling process as well. Yes. I mean, that has to be there I mean, as a follow-up. Yeah. So critically important we deal with that history then and get on with it. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so I'm sorry for revving you up for putting your hands up again. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for everyone who has come. I'd just like to do a huge round of applause for our deadly panel members for getting up here and sharing with us. <laughs>